ahead of these and begin and look at verses 12 through, through 21. So before we get started, I wanted to sort of give you a little bit of um, uh, outline of what Romans is, is all about. Um, Paul lays out Romans very similar to the way he lays out his other letters to the other churches. The first eight chapters deals with the theology, almost just pure theology. And then um, he jumps, as in he does in almost all of his letters, he jumps to a practical application of those. Um, and he, that starts in chapter 12, verses 16, 16 being the last chapter of, uh, of Romans. Um, but there's something different about the letter to the Romans. Right in the middle of his uh, normal process from theology to practicality, he has uh, three chapters, verses 9, 10, and 11, that deals with the rejection of the Jewish people and for, of the Messiah, Christ Jesus being the Christ, as well as the, God pulling from them the responsibility of evangelizing the world and placing that on the church. Uh, this Sunday is the this, is this Pentecost Sunday, Sunday, and this is the birth of the church is represented by this Sunday um, which, um, during the, before Jesus or after Jesus left to go um, and back to, to the Father. So uh, he deals with that in verses 9 through 11. But this morning, we're looking at the very end of this theological process um, that he's talking about in chapter 8. Now, I want us to go back and actually look at some scripture that's in next week's lesson, next week's uh, study. And it's verses uh, uh, 8, uh, uh, chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. Um, this is a, an example of, I think, of where theology is so practical. Um, we need this good theology in our, in our hearts in order for us to live life on a practical basis. So let's go back and look, at, because Paul is setting up uh, this morning's study. He's setting it up with some scripture that we'll look at next week, actually, again. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, <clears throat> looking at verse 18 a little more clearly, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. This is Paul, for I consider... Uh, and the suffering. Uh, Paul obviously had suffered greatly for the gospel, uh, but he says that's not even worth, worth mentioning. He had, um, for Paul and for the Christian today, the world in which he lived was in chaos. Um, the world in which we live is in chaos. Uh, and not just, not just the human relationships that surround us, but the, but the environment that we live in is in chaos as well. For the believer, the suffering that is endured in this life has no comparison to the glory received in eternity. And, and that's where I think that um, we begin to see why and how the theology of, of Romans chapter 8 is so practically applicable to our experience of living life today. In verse 19 he says, For, or we could use the word because, because for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Now, the redemption of the creation is related to the human's relationship, the human relationship with the God of creation. And all of a sudden we began to see the correlation between our environment, um, the world around us, and our relationship to God. And um, it says because or for the creation, the environment, is, awaits eagerly for longing for the revealing of God's Son. So there's a, a longing there that is waiting, waiting for. Um, the believer is considered by God the Father to be the Son of God through adoption. Now that's important for us to recognize because 
Um, if, if all of creation is, is waiting with eagerness for a relationship to develop between man and the God of creation, there's, there's something going on here that's very, very, very significant. And, and we, are, we are sons of God. We have been, we, and we're brought to that point by adoption. God has adopted us. There was only one begotten son, but we are all sons and daughters of God, part of the family of God, because God has adopted us into that family. For, or because, creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Ah, now that's that's perplexing, isn't it? Our environment was subject to chaos because of the willingness, because of God wanted that to uh, apply in and to and, and related to humans, the human experience of knowing and experiencing God. Um, but that's exactly what, what John is saying here. Creation is in, relatively, in relative balance by God's command to prepare mankind to receive eternal life with God in the new Jerusalem that we uh, read about in the Revelation. Um, now, this is revolutionary uh, to me, uh, and it's, it is extremely relevant in our world today, this theology that we're discussing this morning, because Paul is saying that even the environment um, has been influenced by the God of creation in order to, in, uh, and to, to bring about and enhance the relationship that humanity has with the God of creation. Um, for the creation was subject to futility, that's chaos, uh, not willingly, but because of him, it's God, who subjected it. So God did it. Uh, and God did it for the purpose of dealing with the relationship that man has to his God of creation. In hope, now here's, what, here's, the, here's the beautiful part of it. The reason for that was in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So there is a, there's an intimate bond there between our environment um, the, the, and the, the world around us and um, um, the hope that, that God has, that, that the hope that that environment has that its redemption is predicated on and is related to the redemption of humanity to the God of creation. Um, now if that's not relevant, uh, theology, I don't know what is, but it's so important that we, are, that we understand that theology. Um, creation's redemption, that is the new Jerusalem that we read about in Revelation, is related to the redemption of the believer. Um, in verse um, and um, um, in verses tw uh, 22 and 23. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our bodies. And we begin to see something develop here between this adoption concept, between the relationship of the environment in which we live, uh, the world and the environment, uh, and um, the redemption of man in relationship to his God of creation. For we know that the whole creation, that's a man, that's trees, that's mountains, that's creation itself, that creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Um, all creation is yearning for the redemption from the chaos. Um, now, um, we go on a picnic and we sit on a beautiful green uh, meadow and we observe the beautiful mountains that are before us and we talk about and we think about how peaceful it is. Tell a rabbit being chased by a fox that the world and creation is peaceful. Tell the fox that's being chased by the foxhounds that the world is peaceful. They will tell you that it's chaotic, 
that it's the survival of the fittest, that the population dynamics formula says that only the fittest survive, and the, and the slowest one in the herd is the one that gets eaten by the, lamb, by the lion. Now, that's the, that's the chaos that our, our environment is in, and it's, it's, it's relatively balanced. But there's a, here's the principle here. For, for we know that the whole creation is yearning for the redemption from this chaos. Um, now, that word um, groaning is also can be looked at as, as, as yearning for. Um, the best example I can think of is a cold, cold winter day, and you're thinking about what you're going to have for lunch, and you just say, mmm, I just can't, ooh, I just need some good old hot chili, and just yearn for that, groaning for that. That's the, that's the concept of this groaning here, that, it's, that, that the universe is groaning for, yearning for that redemption. And the pain associated with it is the pain like the pain of childbirth. Now, um, my wife tells me that childbirth is pretty painful, but it's different from the pain of childbirth, it's different from the pain of cancer. Because out of that childbirth pain comes the blessing of a child. And so out of this chaos and out of this, this, this pain comes um, the, a childbirth, a birthing experience. And so the, all of creation, all of our environment is predicated on and is, is yearning for the redemption of the adopted sons of God. In verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. You see, there's the creation and we ourselves. That's us. That's Paul, and, that's, and that's, that's all the disciples. That's you and I. Who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. There's that word grown again. Yearn inward, inwardly as we wait eagerly, eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Wait a minute now. We're going to have a redemption of our bodies, and we're yearning for that. We're groaning for that. Our creation that is in chaos, uh, our environment that is in chaos and relatively balanced, but, but chaos is yearning for some kind of redemption that's tied to and related to the redemption of the bodies of the believer. That's what Paul says. When the believer comes to accept Jesus as the Lord, they are adopted as children of God and as descendants of God receive an inheritance. That inheritance is a glorified body. Um, God's Holy Spirit seals our salvation and guarantees that we will receive that inheritance. And that's what it means by the first fruits of the Spirit, that the Holy Spirit abides in us. As we mentioned last week, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit abided in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle first, and then ultimately in the temple. But after the crucifixion, that uh, veil was torn from top to bottom, and now God's Holy Spirit abides in the hearts and minds of people, in our hearts. And so He is abiding on earth today, in and through us as believers. So, And that first fruits of that is uh, that God's Holy Spirit seals us in our salvation. Paul um, had a great, uh, when he was writing to the Ephesians, uh, here's what he said about this whole idea. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So, what you see here is, is that God's Holy Spirit, His presence in us, the first fruits of His presence, and that He seals us. Um, now, what He's sealing is He's sealing our salvation. Nothing can set, snatch us away from God once we come to know Him as Savior and as Lord. And that is a guarantee out of that process. We are guaranteed to receive the inheritance because we're a child, and we're a child of the Father. And every child of the Father is a part of that inheritance. And what is that inheritance? And Paul is, and what we're going to see in, in Romans is that inheritance is a, a resurrected body, a body. And, and all of the environment that we live in is also predicated on that resurrection of, of that body. For in this
this hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So, uh, for in this hope we were saved. In the hope that we would come to know Christ, that God died on the cross for us, and in the hope that we would have a, be resurrected like God, like Jesus was resurrected. So in that hope, um, we, we have, um, we have um, we, in that hope we, were, we are saved. It is in the hope of the cross that the believer has salvation. And as a result of that salvation, we have the hope um, then of the inheritance that we receive the, the glorified body, that we spend eternity not as a, a Jasper the friendly ghost shroud sort of thing, but we spend it in a body, in a physical body that's, that's perfect in all respects. Now, hope, he says, that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? So um, this is not real obvious, isn't it? And so, therefore, there's a hope there. Now, biblical hope is, is not something. It is not just a wishful hope that something will occur that has no real probability of occurring or something that has already occurred. In fact, what real biblical hope is, real biblical hope is, hope is something that one has confidence is going to happen but has not occurred at, the point, at this point in time we can have confidence because the Holy Spirit has guaranteed us in that confidence that we shall be redeemed with our bodies and that our environment, uh, the world around us, will also be redeemed. This world's not intended to last forever like it is. It is tied to the redemption of man. Um, it is tied to the redemption of, of the environment is sort of tied to the redemption of man to the God of, of creation. But if we hope for what we do not see, and that's what we're hoping for, we wait for it with patience. Um, there are three tenses of our salvation, and I, th I think this is important. We, we review this, we've reviewed this a number of times in the past year as we've looked at it, but I think it's important for us to renew it review it again because it tells us and puts, us, puts a context of our, of our scripture this morning in context. The first uh, tense of our salvation is the past tense. We were saved. We were justified. At some point in our life, we surrendered, if we were believers, we surrendered our life to Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, who then gave to us eternal life and guaranteed for us, and, and we were filled with and given God's Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is a guarantee that sealed us in that justification, uh, Paul calls it. Um, and we were justified before God. Now, we weren't perfect, but God considered us to be perfect. That's a, uh, sort of like an accounting. He, he, placed, he placed the resources in our checking account. Um, we didn't earn them, but God put them there, and he justified us, even though we're not justifiable, he did it because of grace. That's the best definition of, of grace we can, we can find, that he justified us, and therefore we were saved, and God's Holy Spirit sealed us in that salvation. But that's not the end of it. That's the beginning of it, because there's a present tense of our salvation. That is that we are being sanctified. That we're, we're beginning to look more like as we live life under God's leadership and under the power of the Holy Spirit, we're beginning to look more like what we have been declared to be under justification. So we're beginning to actually look like we are been justified um, so that we are being saved just like we have been saved, we are being saved. Now, um, Paul again uh, gives us some great insight into that in his book to the letter to the First Thessalonians. He says this, No. May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we don't just sanctify ourselves. We don't just automatically having been saved, uh, then therefore we begin to act like we've been saved. 
Um, we struggle with that because we live in a body that's imperfect. Excuse me, we live in a world that's imperfect. And so we, we struggle with that. But we are being sanctified by God himself. Look, look at that. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, totally, without exception. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be found perfect or blameless uh, at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again. Now, this is New Testament. So Jesus had already come uh, as, the, as the Christ, but he's coming again, and he's coming for his church. And when he does, we, won't be found, uh, we will be found blameless before him because God is in the process of sanctifying us. We should look more like what we have been declared to be today than we did yesterday. And that means because we are being saved. And then the third category of, salva of, our, of our salvation is that we shall, it's a future. We shall be glorified. We have been justified. We are being sanctified. We shall be glorified. And that's what our lesson, our scripture this morning is really dealing with. We shall be saved in the future. We shall be made absent, having been declared perfect, having been growing in our perfection, um, being saved. We shall be perfect at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when we shall be given new bodies um, and there will be a, a new environment as reflected in Revelation as the new Jerusalem. Um, and so uh, there's uh, new, um, uh, new dynamics and new, new laws altogether, the laws of, of, um, of thermodynamics and the laws of, of, uh, of, um, <clears throat> of, of gravity won't necessarily be eliminated but they'll be changed so dramatically that we probably would not, uh, we wouldn't recognize them. So, having the hope of eternal life in a glorified body, now then, should we, how then should we live? And we should live with patience. That's how we should live. We're yearning for, you see, see, going back to that, what Paul's been saying, that both the environment that we live in um, and ourselves that we yearn for we we're thinking about that bowl of chili and we just mm, we just we're just groaning for it and yearning for it uh, the, the, what's going to happen so we we do that with patience and while we are in this life there's a job to be done there's a the task to be carried out there's a responsibility that the church has that was um, that the Jewish na uh, nation had in the Old Testament that has been shifted to the church and the church is now charged with the responsibility of evangelizing the world. The greatest environmental impact you can have is to evangelize the world um, because that's, the environment is predicated on um, the second advent and the changed um, bodies that we will have, the glorified bodies that we will have that will also change our environment. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So there are times when we are just to, over, to overcome by the conditions of the world that we don't even know what to pray for. And so um, this is when God's Holy Spirit is, uh, is, is willing to and is able to because he knows, he knows our mind and heart. He's willing to pray for us and through us. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. God's Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of the believer and therefore knows us better than we know ourselves. Where does God's Holy Spirit dwell in the world today? in the hearts of believers. And, 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 he, and he gives us, he seals us in our salvation. He guarantees us our inheritance. And he also is a, he knows us better than we know ourselves. And so he's able to, uh, to, to pray for us when we don't even know what to pray for ourselves. <clears throat> On occasion, when we don't know that, how to pray and what to pray, God's Holy Spirit is there and can 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 pray for us and does pray for us and through us.
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now this is a, a verse of scripture that we all love to quote. But it's important for us to note something about the, uh, the uh, grammar here. The subject of this sentence is God. It's not all things. So that all things are not good. But God is able to take anything and everything and make it good. Um, good reading of this verse would be, God works all things together for good for those who love him and are called for his purpose. Now, think of that verse and apply it back to what we've been talking about as, as Paul talked about how the environment that we live in is in chaos um, and how the environment is groaning for and, and yearning for the time of the redemption of the, the, the adopted children of God. And think about all the things that's about associated with that chaos in that environment and how God, God changed that environment in order to grow and develop the character of those who are believers. And so when you see that, uh, when you kind of understand that, then this verse really does make a lot more sense, doesn't it? That, um, that God works all things together for good, even the environment, for those who love him and are called for his purpose. So um, what can we learn from the scripture? Well, first of all, I think all believers have God's Holy Spirit living in them. And that's important because, secondly, God's Holy Spirit seals the believer's salvation. And you can have absolute confidence in that. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can because you have been sealed and you have been guaranteed an inheritance. And that inheritance is associated with um, the second advent and the fact that you shall be made perfect having been justified in the process of being sanctified, someday you shall, as a believer, be glorified. And then finally, God's Holy Spirit prays for us, the believer, when, they, when we do not know what to even pray for ourselves. Have you ever really come to a point where something was so burdensome on your heart and you didn't know what to pray for? Um, should you pray for the healing of a loved one? Um, should you... Um, what, was, what, was, what would you really pray for? And at that point, you can be confident that God's Holy Spirit will lead you. And at times, when you can't even get out the words, He will pray for you uh, because he is, he is guaranteeing you that you have your salvation. He's guaranteeing that you have the inheritance that you will receive. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have given to us eternal life. Thank you that you committed yourself to the cross. Thank you that you suffered, Father, that we could have eternal life and that you have redeemed and hope, the hope of redeeming our environment, that you have the hope of redeeming our bodies, that we have been saved, we are being saved, and we shall be saved. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you.